Uh, well, thank you all for coming here today and welcome to this talk. Uh, my name is Alice Ho. I'm the Administrative Services Manager in the library. Um, today, we are very happy to have uh, Dr. Mandy Link to give us a talk. And as you know, we are having an exhibition of uh, Dr. Link, and we will have the opening ceremony this afternoon at 3.30 p.m. And if you have time, please do come to join us. And after the opening ceremony, Dr. Ling will give us a guided tour at 4.15. Okay. okay, now let me briefly um, introduce uh, our wonderful artist, Dr. Mm. Ling. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Ning is a well-renowned calligrapher, designer, and educator. And among his uh, many official capacities, uh, he's currently the um, program leader of the Master of Arts in Design and Senior Lecturer in Design at the University of Sunderland in the UK. He is actually specialized in calligraphy, uh, lettering, uh, typo design, typographic design, and editorial design. And Dr. Ling actually has exhibited in many countries. Um, actually, this is the first time he exhibited in Hong Kong, and we are very honored indeed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Dr. Ling's works uh, appeared in many major publications. Uh, Dr. Ling was actually born in Hong Kong, and he moved to the UK 10 years uh, uh, when he was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. Now, and he is a Chinese uh, citizen, and also his practice in Western uh, art and design has a very significant impact on his life. Um, he's fascinated by the theme crossing boundaries in his works. So you can see East and West, Old and New, simplicity and complexity. I would invite you to personally experience these uh, harmonies and contradictions in his works as uh, we display in this exhibit. Okay, now let's join me in welcoming Dr. Ling. Nobody wants to sit in the front. <laughs> it's the same everywhere. Um, thank you very much for coming this afternoon. I really appreciate you um, spending your time here. I'll do my best to make it uh, enjoyable and uh, um, educational at the same time. Um, yeah, the, the exhibition title is Crossing Boundaries. And the reason I um, use this title is seemingly quite obvious. I'm Chinese. Um, I was raised in the UK. So I have this kind of East to Western um, upbringing. Uh, so as an artist, I think sometimes it's quite natural to bring the two together. But I must say it's far, far easier to learn things from the West than it is to learn things from the East. Uh, as you can appreciate, a lot of Eastern thinking, philosophies, traditions are quite complex and it takes time to unravel. So I hope um, by looking at my work you get a sense of that somehow, okay? <clears throat> um, as Alice says, I'm, I'm a lecturer at the University of Sunderland. I'm also a graphic designer. Uh, I was trained as a graphic designer, so my degree uh, undergraduate degree was, was uh, in that. I, I also specialize in typography. So that means I'm someone who would use um, type and set it in a, in a kind of aesthetically pleasing way. So, you know, I, I appreciate a lot of you just type your, your essays or thesis or reports without really thinking about who designed the font, um, how it should be displayed, what font size, leading, etc., etc. So my job is to really make your text look beautiful and to be very, very legible and, and communicate. Um, also, as an academic, um, my research involves calligraphy. Okay, so the, for the past 20 years at the University of Sunderland, um, I, I've really been uh, involved in lots of research in Western calligraphy, particularly. Um, I instigated the International Research Centre for Calligraphy. Um, it's the first um, research centre of its kind in the world, uh, and I've been running that for the last 20 years. So every, every so often we run lots of international symposiums, exhibitions, publications, and so on. So that's kind of my research as an academic. Um, I teach in the University of Sunderland. It's a relatively small university compa compared to this um, uh, uh, very grand and prestigious um, uh, university. Um, 
and uh, I've been working there for the last 20 years or so. 20 years in May, in fact, so, <laughs> okay. I'll just quickly show you my graphic design work all in one page because I just find my graphic design work, although it's interesting, is, it's rather boring to talk about, you know. Um, I do quite a lot of design work for artists, um, museums and galleries, um, mainly to um, create catalogues, publications relating to the artist's work. Um, it's not that simple, as you can appreciate, because you really have to understand what the artist is trying to do in their work and trying to capture that essence through typography and graphic design. So I have been producing hundreds of catalogues over the years, um, so I won't show you all of them. So it's here, some of the selections of my work in one page. Um, I must say, though, as, as a graphic designer or typographer, a lot of what I do never get sort of appreciated. <laughs> it's true, because, you know, how often when you read a, a book or, or, or a report or, you know, uh, a, a, yeah, any kind of publication, a magazine, where you would say, oh, that's a wonderful design. Oh, I love that choice of font. You never, right? You just flip through the pages, and that's it. So, so our job often, often get ignored, yeah? But that doesn't mean we don't need to do a good job. We still have to, you know? So every detail we would go over, we would spend hours and hours going over details of things. Things that you just wouldn't even notice. And that's our job. So we're the unsung heroes of of uh, society. <laughs> um, any artist, any designer, any creative person would need to have inspiration. I find inspirations by just usually looking at anything, uh, particularly you know, when I'm traveling abroad, I look at things that are slightly unusual to my normal lives. Um, I look at design, I look at art, but I don't normally look at calligraphy. <laughs> it's strange, right? Yeah, I tend to look at um, sculptures, paintings, embroidery, um, quilt making, um, even, even cooking is a creative uh, discipline to me. So a lot of stuff that I do or I see are very inspirational. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. Um, as a graphic designer, when I was a student ooh, 30 odd years ago, um, I was greatly inspired by this um, designer. His name is Herb Lubellen. He designed this logo in 1965, all hand-drawn, OK? Um, it's for a magazine called Modern Child. Now, this is probably one of the most famous logo, and to, in my opinion, one of the best logo ever designed in, in graphic design. If you speak to any graphic designer in my, sort of my generation, they would always say that's the best logo. There's no doubt, you know, OK? Uh, it's just so clever, yeah? And no computers then, young people here, no computers, 1965. You have to draw that by hand with a pen. Gosh, <laughs> it's quite a skill. Uh, I can't do that. It's, it's just too skillful. It's amazing, these people. Um, yeah, so I really like his work. He was my inspiration when I was a student. And, and I, I constantly sort of dig out his work and trying to copy it, just fail miserably. But that's what you do, right? Yeah. Um, and calligraphy, somehow I always like lettering, letter forms, handwriting. However, if I say to you calligraphy, this is probably what you would think of, right? Straight away. Yeah? This is calligraphy. It's an old manuscript, probably um, um, 15th century, black letters. Yeah? Calligraphy also could be in your mind, uh, certificates. Um, it could be about jam jar labels. Uh, it could be, it's just a craft. However, to me, calligraphy is much more than that. Um, to, to me, calligraphy is an art. And you could, if you want to be philosophical about it, you could say calligraphy, calligraphy could be a way of life, a way of living. You know, it, it really kind of leads how you want to live your life through calligraphy. Um, I have a wonderful colleague called Professor Ewan Clayton. We work together quite often, and he's one of my main inspiration for my work. He's someone that took calligraphy, Western calligraphy, from a very kind of formal um, context to something that is really avant-garde. Um, he's pushing the boundary, boundary of legibility. Okay, those are words. And if you really have to, you probably could decode that. Okay, um, but I'll tell you anyway, that says love, 
L-L-V-E. This is silent. And then this is peace. Yeah? So <laughs> once I tell you, you can see the letters, right? Yeah? OK. And this is actually a word as well. It says content. Yeah? I'm happy. Content. Um, these are probably much more harder to read, but, um, but if you have the time, you could probably decode it. Yeah? And, and similarly, with some of my writing, I share a similar kind of um, sensibility. However, it's really difficult for me to do really illegible work because of my training as a typographer, where everything has to be clear and legible and communicate. So this is kind of conflict sometimes. You know, how far can I push myself to be illegible? Yeah, it's very difficult, um, but I'm trying. I also love this guy. He's an American artist. He's not a calligrapher, but his work is very calligraphic, very expressive. Love his use of colors and, and, and gesture. Um, his work is phenomenal. It's, it's literally the size of this wall quite often. Okay? So um, you have to bear in mind the scale of the work. It's not small A3. It's you know, three, four, five meters wide sometimes. So I really like his, his work. Um, this guy is from France, um, Calam. He uses, um, I don't know what technique he used, he uses light to do his calligraphy. So this is not photoshopped with many layers. It's literally taken with one take, it's one photograph. Him moving the light to create the calligraphy. Okay, um, absolutely amazing. And it kind of uh, has similarities with the virtual calligraphy that I was messing around with. Uh, with the tilt brush, so I'm going to demonstrate that later. Uh, if you have the time, I'll kind of show you what I mean. It's, it's doing calligraphy in three-dimensional space, so you're not just writing in a two-dimensional plane, you're actually um, writing with depth, which is quite interesting. It's something that, you know, I'm not very used to, but it's interesting. So it's three-dimensional in, in, in a true sense. Look at that, it's beautiful, right? Yeah. He uses Arabic writing, which uh, has a long tradition of calligraphy, just like Chinese calligraphy. And to me, which, you know, I don't really, I can't read Arabic, but I can really appreciate the aesthetic forms of uh, Arabic calligraphy. They call it the linear graphic, the fifth century term. Fifth century, they call it linear graphic. So linear, as in the line, and graphic, as in the form. So they can, they, at that time, they really understand what calligraphy is, you know, that you can stretch a line, you know. If you think about it in Western letters, let's give an example, an A, you've got a diagonal, another diagonal, and a horizontal. That gives you an A, right? So you could have a very short diagonal, and a very long diagonal, and a tiny, tiny, tiny crossbar. Yeah, that could be an A too. So it's up to you how you can formulate those lines to create your, your, your letter. Anyway, um, I can demonstrate that idea later, probably a bit easier. This is an um, uh, American designer, Tuba, or back. Um, again, this is all hand-drawn, which is very unusual for a young designer to do. Quite often, they would just go into uh, Illustrator, which is a software, uh, and then do the, uh, the design. So this is all hand-drawn with pen and ink. Uh, I really appreciate her skills. She's quite young, sort of 30-ish. And these are all in, uh, letters of the alphabet. So I think that's an F. Um, this is a, a K, yeah? And so on. Now, this is getting even more interesting. Although this is not calligraphy at all, to me, I see that as calligraphic. So in terms of inspiration, um, I, I, I find it very, very um, inspiring. <laughs> um, now, his approach is, he uses computation, so what that means is he actually codes a visual image by hand on the computer to create that. Not using a mouse and click, click, click. He actually codes the coordinates and the density, the color, and everything. And then he designed a plotter, which he can then put whatever implement he wants, a brush, a pen, or whatever. And then that would then draw or print out or plot out his designs. 
But I think that's a really interesting way of working. So you're not using pen and ink, you're using codes to do the job for you. So I think that's a really fantastic way of working. And I have been doing a couple of pieces of work using that method um, too. So I just find these forms beautiful. They're just really nice. And the, the beauty of these, uh, uh, using this approach is, you can print that as big as you want, you know, uh, or as small as you want, or as many times as you want. It's just beautiful. He also designed his own um, letter forms. Again, I suppose, if you've got the time, you can decode it and, and read it. But uh, <laughs> I've yet to try that. But um, yeah, so quite often with my work um, over, I've been doing calligraphy for possibly about 36 years or more. OK. Um, yeah, so it's quite funny because my friend asked me, oh, how long did it take you to do that piece of work? I said, 15 minutes. And then actually, it's, it took me 36 years to do 15 minutes of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to really think like that because, yeah, it, I, I write my calligraphy quite quickly, 15 minutes, half an hour. However, it took me literally over 30 years to be able to do that. So when you look at my work, um, you know, please bear that in mind. It's, it's not that simple. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and of course, um, with a lot of my work lately, the last 10 years or so, I've been exploring um, sort of how to, how to um, well, first of all, I need to identify what calligraphy it is, uh, it is to, to myself. Um, so if we look back at a lot of these work here, Although they all look very different, there's a common theme that runs through them. And that is, there's a sense of energy in that work, in this work, right? Do you agree? Can you see the, the energy, the spirit, the, the gestural quality? And I'm trying to find out what's that, what, what is that, what is that? How do you describe that? Is there terminology that would describe this kind of spirit, this gesture, this rhythm, and so on, so on? And at the time I was uh, embarking on my PhD, it took me eight years, <laughs> a long time. And, and through my research, I actually realized a lot of this thinking has all been written down two and a half thousand years ago in Chinese literature, in Chinese art, yeah. Uh, and a lot of these Chinese um, philosophies and traditions relating to painting and calligraphy is it, very applicable to what we do now with technology, Western art, particularly with calligraphy. Um, so that realization is really, really important, obviously. And there was a Chinese term, which is in, in Cantonese is Hei Wan Sang Dong, yeah, or Mandarin Qi Yun Xian Dong. Pardon my Chinese, I'm really terrible <laughs> pronunciation. Um, it means the rhythmic vitality of a piece of work or writing. So when you, when you put a mark on a paper, um, if I show you, when you write something or when you paint something, it leaves traces of yourself in those marks. That energy, that spirit, that essence of yourself. So when I do a piece of mark, that's me. When Alice do a piece of mark, it's her, right? It's her, her, her mark, her essence, her spirit. So we all have different essences or spirits and is, is able to kind of learn to how to tap into that. And that's, that's the hardest part. And, and the other thing is, it's actually extremely difficult to articulate these ideas, in English anyway, and then to write about it. It's really, really difficult. There's, there's no books that I've come across which kind of describes all this, apart from one. And it was about um, um, uh, Chinese, the, the canon, um, the Chinese painting canon of the 5th century, okay? So it's kind of translated from the Chinese, so that's the only mention of, um, of, of um, Chi Yung Shen Dong in, in uh, English text. <clears throat> so I managed to kind of uh, correlate the two. Um, so as you can see with my calligraphy, there's a, a kind of an energy or spirit or something, uh, or, you know, rhythm that goes on in the work. Um, so I quite often do these small, quick, um, I call these sketches because they're not really anything important, but 
it's enjoyable to do. I usually do these for Facebook, you know, like friend's birthday, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, if you're my friend, you might get one of these. <laughs> Oops. Um, I also did a, a logo for a friend in uh, Hong Kong, Blink Gallery. They're doing very well at the moment. It's a vibrant art scene in Hong Kong, and um, you're very lucky to be in this hub of um, um, creativity and, and, and culture, I think. We don't get much of that in England, surprisingly. Um, so you're very, very uh, lucky to, to be in this place. Um, yeah, uh, I do sketches like this using just scans of different brush marks and then combine them together using Photoshop. It's quite very quick and easy, but quite fun to do. Yeah, a lot of my work's really, not really that serious, so don't try and read too deeply into it. it, it it's, it's just a piece of work, okay? Um, it's, you know. Um, for my sins, I, I do um, a piece of work um, every year for my wife, um, particularly Valentine's Day. I haven't done so lately because I've been so busy, but uh, I've been doing that for many years. Um, so this is a piece of work I did um, ooh, about 12 years ago. Um, it says, from all of the words that I have painted, all of my words are you. And her name is Sue, so letter S. It's all done by hand. Uh, and then scanned and then put together. Um, so you have one, two, three, about four different elements put together uh, in Photoshop. Now, working digitally is fine, but um, I always find it much more enjoyable if I write the calligraphy first by hand and then scan it in, rather than using a digital tablet to do the calligraphy. And do you know why it is? It's all to do with the tactile feeling which is really important when you do calligraphy. When you use a brush to do Chinese calligraphy or a pen to do Western calligraphy, it's the contact of the pen and the ink on the paper that makes it special. If you use a digital tablet or a mouse, there's no connection. It's just like click, click, click. It's too smooth, too artificial. So to me, I, I, I never enjoy doing calligraphy in that way, um, digitally, but I always find it easier or better if I do the calligraphy first scan it, and then compose it using software. Um, tomorrow, I will be running a workshop with two million students. <laughs> <laughs> How many? 45? Uh, 45. Yeah, something like that. I don't mind that. I was just joking. Um, we're going to make um, folded pens using a, a Coca-Cola can or beer can or whatever can you can get hold of. It's quite fun, OK? Um, it's home handmade, and you can make some really interesting marks from it. And this is an example of what you can do with the folded pen. Okay, um, it's just letters of the alphabet: uh, H, I, J, K, M, N, O, P, something like that. Okay. But I just love the quality of the marks. It's very expressive, and how one can really stretch the line. Again, this idea of the linear graphic from Arabic calligraphy um, came through here. I do construct lettering using software. And, and sometimes, because to be honest, I'm a very lazy designer and artist. So what I, whatever I can get away with, I'll get away with. You know. So if you look at that, it looks quite complex. But actually, I've just copied and pasted lots of the, the shapes. So for example, here and here, it's the same shape. Yeah. It's copy and paste, great. Um, here and here, it's just that, that and that is the same. Um, all these curves are similar, so I just kind of manipulate the, um, the shapes. So as you can see, my secret's out. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> okay. Um, sometimes I cheat. I would do many T's or many S's and then many whatever, and, and I do it until I, oh, I like that one, I'll keep that, and then I'll, I'll don't like that one, throw that away. Uh, for example, here, the word calligraphy, the H and the Y, the original one I didn't like, so I, I just did a couple more H and Y, oh, I like that one, put it together, you know, that kind of thing. So I'm kind of cut and paste different bits. So here, this, what you see, seemingly is written all in one go, it's actually um, about four or five different. Um, bits stuck together, 
in Photoshop, but don't tell anyone, okay? <laughs> now, once it's digitized, you can then do a lot of things with it. So, for example, in the exhibition, I've been laser etching some of the designs onto plywood, okay? So, using a laser cutter, so you can instruct the laser cutter not to cut straight through the wood, just enough to burn the wood, to leave a mark, yeah? Um, so it's almost like engraving, you know? And again, you can have that any size you want because it's digitized. And, and these are all handwritten um, calligraphy, scanned and then uh, laser etched. I quite like the, um, the O and the Q. They're just two ink blobs, you know. Um, always believe to have fun in what you do, so don't try and make it too serious. Um, so quite often I, I deliberately do things to, to make it a bit quirky or, or different, just for the hell of it. <laughs> um, the alphabet. This is quite interesting. This is a piece of work similar to some of these here um, where it has different tonalities. So, for example, here you have, you have the white of the paper. You have this very dense black mark here and then mid-gray, the writing and so on, so on. Now, what the um, scanner could do is to recognize the different tones and then the laser uh, cutter could then etch away the darkest part, sorry, the lightest part, so the lightest part get etched away, taken away, and the darkest part gets left out. So it's the reverse. So the letters, for example, would be um, embossed, sticking out. And then all the, all, the, all the paper bits would be cut away. So there's an example of this work in the exhibition somewhere. So this is, one, this is the piece. So you can see here, this is the original uh, surface of the wood. Uh, and these have been cut away. And the colleague for you, the calligraphy has been um, left out and touched. Quite small, actually. Um, so it's very interesting way of working. So it's the first piece that I did, so I, I'm going to try and uh, do a few more of these when I get back to the UK. I literally did this the week before um, kind of coming here, so <laughs> there's a new technique. <laughs> um, I also, um, I'm not very good at coding, so I asked one of my PhD students who's fabulous with computation and coding to, to code the, the design of this and then to use the, um, the laser cutter to etch away the, the lines. So the interesting thing is, um, if you imagine the, the laser cutter doing this all over the paper, every time it comes to the end and goes to a different direction, it slows down, right? So therefore, you get a heavier mark. And then as it speeds away, you get a lighter mark, you know? So, so that's quite interesting. So it's kind of a, a jumbled up kind of a mark, and then contrasting that with a quote. Um, basically, I believe there's no simplicity without complexity. I think the two has to kind of work together. And if you understand that principle, you can apply that to, um, to lots of things. Any coders here? Any mathematicians, computer, uh, computing scientists? One? You probably appreciate to do a, a, a very simple code is hard, right? A simple kind of you know, streamlined set of code is really difficult. It depends on the purpose. If uh, you're right, uh, we can get um, interesting results when yeah. use computer for calligraphy. Yeah. So, um, yeah, might need to speak to you a bit more later. <laughs> yeah. So I always believe in simplicity, how you can distill lots of elements down to this bare essential. Simplicity doesn't mean having nothing on a page or just having one or two elements. It's, it's all about simplicity of the approach and, and how you think about an idea and how you then distill that idea into a, a visual form. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, this is quite interesting, pyrographic work. So this, I'm literally playing with fire here. It's quite dangerous, but really exciting and interesting. Um, I made a video, or someone did, not me. Um, I'm just going to show you.
So, we have a wonderful um, National Glass Centre in Sunderland, one of the biggest in, in, in the world. And obviously, you know, I'm very intrigued with the processes of glass making. So, um, this is done many years ago now, and basically you draw the hot glass from the furnace, and then you burn the paper with it. Now, seemingly, the glass is very soft and malleable, but in fact, it hardens quite quickly. So within 10, 15 seconds, it becomes quite hard, and then you have to change the way you, you, you press down onto the paper because it makes a totally different kind of mark. So within a very quick time, you have to get used to the material, um, the way you hold the, the glass, uh, the metal rod, and for how long. For example, if you hold it for too long, it all just goes up in flames because <laughs> it's too hot. So you need to, have, need to have an assistant with a, a water spray to... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously you would do it on a concrete floor and not on carpets, yeah? <laughs> yeah, can you see the flames coming up there? Yeah. So um, if you look at the um, six pieces of work there on the left, the, the four from the left to the middle there, is one set of work. Um, so basically we have four pieces of paper on the floor and we just literally burn the four pieces of paper together um, and so on. <clears throat> yeah, can you see the, <laughs> the big holes there? So quite often, you know, there's, there's actually holes and things like that in, in the work. Now, you might think, oh dear, you know, I've just ruined it. Well, in fact, I, I, I actually embrace the, uh, the, the holes because now I can put gold leaf underneath to make it sparkle. And you can charge more because it's gold, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, only joking. <laughs> um, so, yeah, imperfection to me is, is actually quite interesting. Yeah, so that's the, um, the work. <clears throat> um, a lot of what I do is quite challenging in the sense I sometimes don't really plan my designs. I just let it happen. It's quite strange. So I have this idea about making a, a kind of a landscape across four pieces of work. I have an idea about this poem by Shirley. It's about one's love for nature and so on and so on, but what does it all mean if you're by yourself? You know, that kind of thing. So it's quite a romantic piece of text. Um, so I know that I have to leave some space for my writing, and that's it really. So once I've got the pyrographic work, I have to then take it home and do the calligraphy. So imagine if I make a mistake anywhere along the line, I, I can't do it again, right? Because I have to then make the whole four pieces again. So there's the challenge. There's the challenge of doing the calligraphy by hand and try not to make any mistakes. However, I do make mistakes all the time. And I do swear. <laughs> uh, here's a close-up of it. I just love these lines. They're so beautiful, very sensual, and, and so on. Close-up of the calligraphy. another piece. I mentioned before about inspiration. I, I take lots of inspirations from nature, particularly uh, sort of leaves and flowers and things like that. And also um, <clears throat> landscapes. Um, we have a plant in our office called Lola. <laughs> we, we've been <laughs> looking after it for 20 years or so. So anyway, um, we moved office recently and Lola disappeared. So we were really, really sad. Yeah, so seriously, it just disappeared. We, don't, we couldn't find it. So anyway, I was so glad I, I actually did something with Lola because <laughs> I, 
I, I, I was really intrigued by the shapes of the leaves. It's got wonderful shapes. So I, I've been looking at it every day, you know, and quite often you have ideas, but you don't really do anything with it. So, you know, I've been looking at it for years and years, but I never kind of bother to do something with it with a pen. And then one day it just kind of um, happened. I don't know how or why. So I was um, given a piece of text by John Stratton, um, who's a, a wonderful poet. Um, and I was trying to write his text, and I just couldn't do it. Uh, I just couldn't, because I was trying to do it in this kind of style. And it just, to me, it just didn't work. I don't know why, it just didn't work. It's like playing a piece of music with a different, a wrong instrument, you know? It has to be a piano, not a guitar, you know, it's that kind of thing. So to me, that just didn't work for that uh, text. So I was getting really kind of angry. I was like, Come on, Manny, why can't you do it? Come on, you know. So anyway, um, so I thought, okay, just calm down. And I sat down, and, and this came out. It's amazing. It's really, I was just like blown away. So to me, this is the most important piece of work so far. Not these, you know, <laughs> seemingly finished pieces. This kind of sketch, to me, is most important because it suddenly just, it just made me realize, oh, I could do writing in this way. And it's all inspired by Lola. So I'm happy that, although she's not with us anymore, uh, we still have kind of her, her essence in, in there somewhere. Yeah, can you recognize the, um, the shapes yeah. of the leaves and so on? Yeah, it's really strange. I, 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 I just don't know why it just happened. It's really strange. I can't really explain it. This is strange, but Lola type. <laughs> Lola script. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's the kind of first instance where I wrote in this way. And since then, this is like five years ago, six years ago, I've been exploring this kind of way of writing through some of my uh, work here. It, it's very liberating. As an artist, when you have that kind of uh, realization, it's, 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 it's wonderful. It really is. So I've been developing different ways of writing. Uh, this is capitals. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's a mixture of brown ink with red ink and gold powder. Okay. Now normally when you write, if you want to have gold powder on the writing, you would do the writing and then while the ink's still wet, you'll sprinkle some gold powder on top. I'm too lazy for that, so I just put the ink powder into the ink and I scoop up the, the, the gold powder as I write. It actually gives a much better effect. So, so that's quite quite nice technique. So quite often I discover new techniques due to my laziness. So it's good to be lazy sometimes, yeah? Okay. Here's another one. <clears throat> you probably can get a sense of the, some of the strokes has some oriental elements in them, kind of Chinese calligraphy, calligraphic elements. So it's all written by pen, a broad edge pen, uh, not a brush. Um, yeah, I call these um, color graphic flowers. You know, I just write, in, I start with a, an A and then a B, a C, a D. I just, you know, rotate the paper around. Um, and then you can really play around with the, uh, the spaces and so on. And then you just contrast that with simple writing. This is the first piece that I am um, starting to use um, Chinese ink painting techniques. Um, now, I, I've never trained as a Chinese calligrapher or Chinese painter, so a lot of these techniques I kind of just mess around, if you like, you know, just kind of try and discover for myself. So, in terms of the material, so we use um, Chinese paper, sunji, yeah, is that right? Sunji, and then Chinese brushes or Japanese brushes, um, Chinese or Japanese inks. Uh, I'm just kind of trying to um, discover really what's possible. So, if you're purists of Chinese painting, you probably would just like, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> but to me, I, had, I, I didn't come from any kind of rules. I didn't have any rules, so I was just doing what seemingly works for me. So again, the writing, Lola, writing. 
Um, I think this is so this is a um, few couple of years later, so you can see the development of the marks. I think it's much better in this one, and these are more recent. I really love the subtlety of the ink um, on the paper, and it only works if you use the right kind of ink on the right kind of paper with the right kind of brushes. So it's, it's a whole combination of different things that will make it work. And I suppose that will come, just come from experience. So you kind of know what the combinations are. <clears throat> For example, this mark here took probably about two or three minutes to, to make. It's not a very, it's not kind of a quick, you know, it, it, you really have to kind of really, I don't know, put the chi in the <laughs> brush mark. <laughs> A bit like Kung Fu. <laughs> yeah, you see the texture? Now, I don't know if you know, um, you, you, you all know about Chinese ink or Japanese ink. It's black, right? Well, it's not. Quite often, there's very, very subtle, um, depending which ink you use. Um, there's blue, there's green, there's red, there's brown. So sometimes, again, if you know which ink to use, you can then... Um, you know, use that to your advantage. So, so this one here is actually quite a, a sort of a bluey, cool black. Okay, so not all blacking is black. It's actually got colours in them. <laughs> yeah, uh, I must confess, I didn't write this. Uh, my my PhD student uh, did that. I, I did this, so it's a, a collaboration. Okay. I really like this poem. So that's the writing. And sometimes you, you, you do things and then you discover new ways of doing a letter, for example. So, uh, where is it? Yeah, this D, for example. It's the first time I did a D like that. And I was quite happy with that discovery. So, so, so the, the, it's important to you know, keep practicing and playing and not to be too, kind of, too precious about what you do. And then things will happen, you know. Uh, this one, I use a, a great big brush that I have at home, and then I just went plonk like this, uh, and the ink splattered everywhere. I have to make sure I wear all black, otherwise I <laughs> get ink all over the place. And it just says, in the beginning was the word, so it's like the beginning of a mark. In the beginning was the word, so it's just a kind of that uh, association from the Bible. Okay. I love these four blobs of ink. It took about a day to dry. <laughs> Again, um, all of you in one line. It's quite difficult for me to explain what that means. Um, I had that idea, all those words, all of you in one line. Um, I suppose it's about um, expressing your, your feelings for someone, um, and, and that person is captured in one line, maybe, something like that. It's quite um, difficult to explain. <laughs> I came across this one, one year when I was lying on, uh, on a piece of grass next to the river, and I can hear the wind blowing. So the wind blows, the water flows, my heart grows with the thoughts of you. Just a kind of romantic gesture. <laughs> yeah. I love this quotation. And this is the one that I made a mistake in. Um, obviously not this piece, but um, previous to that. It says, draw bamboos for 10 years. Become a bamboo, then forget all about bamboos when you're drawing. It's just so applicable to everything that we do. It doesn't matter if you're cooking, coding, um, doing calligraphy, designing, if you're a mathematician, whatever. You know, you have to really understand the subject. And once you understand the subject, forget about the subject. Just do it. And then things will flow. Right? It's true. You know? So when I do my calligraphy, I don't think I'm doing calligraphy now. I'm just saying to myself, oh, I'm just having fun. Yeah? And if it works, great. If it doesn't, well, do another one. So that's always my attitude. You know? So when I, <laughs> I tell you where I made the mistake, it was the last word of the last line. I spelled drawing wrong. I, I missed out the R. 
So I have a studio upstairs in my house, and I was like swearing. <laughs> and my wife's like, oh, you made a mistake again. Yes. <laughs> Luckily, I have another piece with the same background, so I managed to, um, to do that. Um, yeah, um, there's, there's three scrolls in that uh, room there where I collaborated with a Japanese sumi painter called Christine Flint Sato. So she did the wonderful painted background and then she folded the work, put it in an envelope and sent it to me in the UK. And then I opened it thinking, oh my goodness, I have to write on top of this? You know, so it's very scary. So imagine, you know, um, she's a fantastic uh, artist, and then having to write on top of her work. And however, when you write on the uh, shun paper, it's, it's really difficult. If you write, if you put any ink on the paper, it will just bleed. So what you have to do, you have to, again, another process that I discovered because I was lazy, um, you have to use acrylic matte medium, watered down with water. And then you have to paint it all across the entire piece of work. So imagine doing that to someone's work. So I did it anyway. OK. And then it worked. Um, so then the challenge is to having to write this um, on the work without making any mistakes. And thank goodness I, I managed to do it OK all in one go, one evening. Um, so uh, it's a new way of what writing is written vertically. It's in English. I don't know if you can read that, but again, if I help you, you probably could decode it. So here's an E. Yes, E, V, E, R, Y, D, A, Y, every day. Yes, can you see now? Yeah? Okay, well, work out the rest now. <laughs> every day is a journey, and the journey itself is home, Asho. Okay, it's a quote by a Japanese a Zen um, monk called Basho. So every day is a journey, and the journey itself is home. Yeah, quite a profound kind of um, quote. Yeah, so writing English or Latin letters vertically is actually really difficult. Unlike Chinese, where you can join and link letters together or characters together, uh, writing, in this case, English vertically and trying to join some of the letters together is really, really hard. Um, so again, this idea of trying not to push it too far so it's totally illegible. So I hope, now I've told you, you probably could read some of the, the words, yeah? So can you read that one? Every day, well done, see? You can do it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, and so on. And this is the one over there, and um, the same quote. Yeah, um, just to finish, I, I mentioned before that I, I get inspirations by looking around stuff, and I don't know if you notice potholes like this. It's everywhere in the city. And honestly, wherever I go, China, Hong Kong, Japan, England, I, I take photographs of them. <laughs> I don't know why, I just love them. I really do. So I have a whole collection of these, hundreds of these. Yeah. Um, you could say why, I don't know. But um, I think what it is, if you just take one photograph of this, it, it's kind of meaningless. It, you know, it's just potholes, right? It doesn't mean anything. But when you put them together, they begin to have a narrative or context. So I quickly took some photographs of potholes, literally in the street that I live. It's not a long street, so I just went around like this, and then I put it into, together into a, a, a quick slideshow. I just want to show you this um, to end the presentation, just to show you that there's beauty in everything. Seemingly things that are ugly, you know, that we don't take notice of, can be objects of beauty. It depends how you put them together, how you use it, then they become important. So I'm just going to show you this quick video.
I mean, I can literally give a lecture about this for a whole hour if you want me to, but I won't. Um, it's really interesting because, you know, not only uh, every piece is designed, it has a, a, a function, yes, and you can look at it historically. Who made these things? Why are they there? In terms of material, in terms of engineering, it's, it's actually quite difficult to make these. Um, it, it, it shows, a, um, you know, the society that we live in, what sort of things, that, you know, cable TV, um, drainage, um, whatever, whatever. You know? So it tells a lot of stories. So next time when you look at a pothole, don't just say, Ugh, you know. Have a, have a, have a you know, praise, you know, what, you know, why is there and, and what for. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have been to Japan. They do the most beautiful potholes ever. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Anyway, thank you very much. Um, what I'm going to do is demonstrate, yeah just for 10 minutes or so, so you get an idea how my calligraphy uh, arrives, okay? And then if you have any questions, please feel free to, to ask. What I'll do is I'll start with the, um, the folded pen. There's variations of, of the pen. This is um, slightly thicker. Now, when you do calligraphy, posture is really important. Um, so quite often, depending on what kind of tools you're using, so for example, the folded pen, I always find it easier if I stand and write rather than sit down. And it's all because of the arm movement. Okay? Because if I sit down, I'm restricted. Whereas if I stand up, I can really have a full range of movement. Okay? So, for example, I quite often move the paper. Sorry, have my what's my hand in the way? Yeah. What's my name? That's your name, Alice. Yes. yes thank you. <laughs> you can read your name, well done. <laughs> um, yeah, um, the folded pen is a really expressive tool. It has, it allows me to really um, play around with the elastic, elasticity of the line so I can stretch it or I could condense it to whatever way I want. So, for example, the G, sometimes rather than doing this, I turn it paper upside down and I do that instead. It's just far easier. Okay? So, it's, it's about the gestural movement. And quite importantly, it, it sounds really strange, but I find if you have both of your feet flat on the ground, you get a much better mark. I mean, it's, it's fairly impossible to do it with one leg, but. <laughs> it sounds strange, but even when I sit down, I, I always have my feet flat on the ground. I don't cross my legs underneath the chair, as we do, because it's comfortable. Um, but I'll show you in a minute. Um, so, yeah. I can really play around with the visual space of, of the paper to, to make it work. Um, Okay. And sometimes you can have fun with the letters. It doesn't have to be all formal and So just by using the thin edge of the pen, I can create quite a fun set of letters, yeah? Okay. Uh, 
I also have um, the camera, these pens. They have a much broader nib. These are called automatic pens. They're quite old. They're about 30, 40 years old. This is quite old, and this is newer, about, about 10 years old. Um, and basically, the letters, the size of the letters, are determined by the width of the nib. Obviously, the wider the nib, the larger the letter, smaller the nib, the smaller the letter. Okay? So if I may demonstrate. Now, for this, I have to sit down. Okay? And yeah, and so posture is very important. I always try and have feet uh, flat on the ground, which then pushes my back straight. So I'd, I'd never have any back problems when I write. Um, and I always try and write centrally, okay? Never sort of lean over and so on. Depending on the paper and the ink that you use, sometimes it can make a huge difference to your writing. Now, this paper um, is actually quite nice to write with because it's quite smooth. And sometimes if you write with more textured paper, it gives you a, a different effect. So that's OK, too. OK. Now, more, if I do it more in a traditional style, um, I'm writing what we call the um, Italic script from the 15th century, from Italy. At the time, it was the age of the Renaissance. So they were trying to think of ways to write more quickly and more beautifully. Because before that, it was the black letters, very straight and quite horrible looking, really, and hard to read. So they developed the Italic writing Okay, so that's what you would call uh, a more formal italic, and this is kind of my way. And as you can see, in terms of the, the speed and the forms, I just find that quite boring to me. <laughs> so I'd rather kind of just... use my own... Why not fill in the O and the A? So in some ways, I'm breaking the rules, which is fine. But I always say to my students, yes, do break the rules, but you need to know what the rules are first before you can break them. OK? <laughs> it sounds obvious. Don't break the rules when you don't know what the rules are. So because I've been doing it for so long, I kind of know what the rules are, so I can break them. And I'm old anyway, so I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but in all seriousness, any kind of thing that we do, um, we need to have, we need to understand and learn the, the discipline first, OK? In calligraphy, we have a, a saying. It's called disciplined freedom. So once you know the rules and the discipline, once you practice enough, and you know exactly what you need to do, then you can you know, develop the sense of freedom. Okay? Uh, and that's very, very important. So, yeah. Um, okay, I think that's, yeah. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much, yeah. uh, Dr. Ling. Yeah, it's really uh, fascinating. Okay, now it's time that we probably have to move to the uh, inner gallery and to see uh, Dr. Ling demonstrate how to use the tool brush to do three-dimensional calligraphy. So while we're waiting for the screen, has anyone got any questions, yeah, any questions or comments? Any questions want to ask uh, many? Don't be shy. Yeah. I'm only here this Right. He'll be leaving week. very soon. Uh -huh. I'm leaving on Saturday. So. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. What do you think of, of the future of your profession? I mean, uh, nowadays we can notice a computer <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. What about the future? What's mm. your opinion? Oh, I, think, I think computer and calligraphy has a great um, future. 
there's so many things we haven't done yet uh, with, with computing and, and calligraphy. I just love the idea of this new, old and new, you know, um, to bring them together somehow. So we're beginning to use computation to create marks. We're beginning to use virtual reality. We, we kind of can do calligraphy in 3D uh, environments and so on. So um, who knows? Uh, maybe arti artificial intelligence. Uh, you can think it, and then you all write it for you. I don't know. Um, anything's possible, isn't it, really, almost? You know? So but I think it's really exciting. I think it's just you just need to pair had two people together who share the same kind of um, sensibilities and, 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 and ideas together to make it work. I mean, ideally, if, if, you know, if I'm a wonderful programmer, coder, and I know calligraphy very well, I can just do it. But unfortunately, uh, <laughs> coding is just beyond my uh, uh, you know, capacity. So yeah, I would probably have to, and I have worked with um, um, programmers before in the past to produce work, kind of, because I, I understand the processes and understand the outcome. So I would say, oh, if I have this idea of this and then, could you do it? And they always say, yeah, sure. <laughs> Two days later, they come up with something beautiful, you know? So yeah, wonderful. I mean, I'd love to work more with computing. Yeah, definitely. Good question. Anyone else? Yes, Thomas. Not too difficult, OK? Uh, <laughs> I, I know you've been teaching students. Uh, in England mm -hmm. and in mainland China. Yeah. So what is your experience in teaching Chinese students Western calligraphy or English students on, on Western calligraphy? Um, to be really honest with you, um, I travel quite a lot. I go to Trinidad, Japan, China, Hong Kong, all over the place. And I, I engage with students and people. <laughs> There's no secret in this. All the students are the same everywhere you go. Seriously. Um, some are very good, some are okay, and some are just terrible, you know. <laughs> yeah? And, um, yeah, and, you know, it's just, they, they're pretty much the same, surprisingly, you know. I would thought, oh, Chinese students, they, they, they must know more about calligraphy than English students. No, it's the same, you know. Um, so on, so on. So, yeah. Um, but what I find interesting is, um, particularly with the Chinese students, I think is because of our language and our culture. Um, when I explain things, they tend to understand uh, quicker than English students. You know, certain concepts. If I say, you know, as a, as a, as a concept, I mean, you know, harmony between man and nature. If I say that to English students, they're like, what are you talking about? You know, whereas some Chinese students get it. Even though they might not understand the, the overall concept, they, they understand the, the principles of it, you know, um, that kind of thing. So I suppose in that sense, um, the, the Chinese language to me is very rich and very fascinating. Yeah. I just wish I, I, I can speak better and, and I can write better Chinese, then probably my calligraphy could be better too, in that sense. I think they all kind of relate and connect. Yeah? You can see the demonstration of this screen. Yeah. I like this one. Can you all see? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um. Okay, so I'll literally just play with this for a couple of days, so there's a lot of things I still need to learn. So as you can see here, you know, I've got a brush mark and and I can control the thickness of the brush. 
I can change the color. OK, can you all see that? Yeah. Um, but quite interestingly, I can paint now behind the paint lettering, <laughs> yeah, which you couldn't do on paper, obviously. Um, so that's interesting. So that's something I need to get used to. You can also paint over the pink and behind the pink or the orange, which is really interesting. So with that in mind, I, I quite like this. Um, so I'm painting far away, and then I'm coming out. So I'm kind of doing a, a three-dimensional object here. Um, change the color a bit. OK. So um, let's just write my name. It's not. Can you see the light and the shadow? It's quite interesting. And then I can push through that A, come out, come this way. Same here. So, yeah, um, and then I can resize it. And then do more, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's some interesting ones, um, like burning coal. That's quite nice. And stars as well. I am writing letters, you know. <laughs> ah, rainbow's quite nice. Let's have some fire. I can delete, which is great. Yeah. Your university's on fire. <laughs> OK. Um, and so on, so on. Um, lots of different brush marks. Um, disco, what's this one then? Um, oh. Interesting. that? It says disco dancing. <laughs> okay. Um, I was going to say. Okay. Um, because I'm writing in space, um, gesture 
is, is really important. So my arm is moving and I'm realizing I can also go this way as well. Um, so it's a really interesting, a very, very different way of, of doing calligraphy. Um, Yeah, it's very, very, uh, I'm sure, you know, if I had more time, I probably could create something a bit better. And I'm sure you're all down to have a go, right? <laughs> Which you can. So yeah, so here's some examples of what you can do. It's quite strange because as I look down onto the floor, it's just empty space. There's lots of stars and Milky Ways underneath me. It's really strange. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think that's probably enough. Uh, Any one of you want to try? <laughs> Give it a try. Yeah, <laughs> Don't be shy. Anyone? Oh. Okay. No, really, you must have a go. Yeah. <laughs> TK, have a go. Yeah. So actually, this is uh, what we call the VR uh, calligraphy corner. So you can come back anytime um, in the afternoon uh, or lunchtime. Uh, we will have uh, student helpers uh, to help you with uh, doing this uh, uh, toothbrush. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Actually, you could you delete. Could, yeah, you could delete my. No. My. See what happened? Yeah. That's it. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Come on, some of the boys dying to have a go. Come on. More, more pata, right? you? No? Mm. Okay. Okay, then um, that's uh, probably the end of our talk and demonstration. And if you have questions, just feel free to talk to Manny. Mm. And yeah. Yeah, he's happy to, uh, to talk to you. Yeah.